Hello, and thanks for joining us. We really appreciate your interest in these sessions, and we hope that you find them encouraging. Let's begin with some singing. Sleeping thy present my life Be thou my wisdom Thou my true word I ever with thee And thou with me, Lord Thou my great Father And I thy true Son Thou in me dwelling and I with the one Riches I heed not No man's empty praise Thou mine inheritance Now and always Thou and thou only The first in my heart High King of heaven My treasure of heaven, my victory won. May I reach heaven's joys, O oh, bright heaven's sun. Part of my own heart, whatever befall, still be my vision, O oh, ruler of all. Still be my vision, O oh, ruler of all In the cross alone I go Recognition laying down Greatest treasures count as worthless Standing to heaven's crowns, standing next to heaven's crowns. In the cross alone I glory, ever reaching for the prize, pressing on and laying hold of that for which my Savior died. My Savior died In the cross alone I go Nothing of my own to give Only that which Christ has offered For my soul that I may live For my soul that I may live Cross alone I go, holding fast the word of life, toiling not in vain but being poured out as a sacrifice, poured out as a sacrifice. In the cross alone I go. Nothing of my own to give Only that which Christ has offered For my soul that I may live For my soul that I may live Never will I seek the glory That was never meant for me Always heaven would reflect all to Jesus to receive, all to Jesus to receive in the cross. 
cross alone I glory Nothing of my own to give Only that which Christ has offered For my soul that I may live For my soul that I may live I especially like the lyrics from the song that we just sang, In the Cross Alone I Glory. The reason I like them is because they remind me of one of Paul's prayers. It was actually a prayer for himself in Galatians chapter 6. And this is what he said. May I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't that great? So let's take a moment to remember that it is on the ground that that the ground, rather, of our salvation is the full sufficiency of Jesus' sacrifice. It's Jesus, only Jesus. I'm going to ask you to pray with me. Our Father in heaven, today as we pray, we draw inspiration from your word that says, let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Lord, we choose to pray because we can and because we're needy and because you're merciful. We ask that you would move throughout the world and especially here in Alberta so that people would treat you with the honor you deserve. Long may you reign over us. We pray that you would meet our needs for daily bread, for the grace to treat others kindly, and for protection from the evil one. Lord, you know the many ways that our lives have been complicated by the pandemic. So help us cope and to be careful without being fearful. Heal those who have been infected, Comfort the families of those who've lost loved ones. Help those working on a vaccine. And strengthen health care workers. Lord, we ask that you would help those that govern to be humble and wise, not arrogant and foolish. And help us to find time, to make time, for those who may have fewer supports in their lives, who may be lonely, ill, or doubting. Help us, Father, as a Christian community to remain unified and vigilant, to be patient with one another. We say today that we hold on to your promises, your promises of answered prayer, of your presence among us, of being with Christ when we leave this life, of new life in renewed bodies when Jesus returns. We thank you for your promises. And Lord, as we enter this Thanksgiving weekend, we are mindful of your goodness to us. By all accounts, the harvest this year has been especially bountiful. We have most everything that we need. Thanks be to God. And now may your word, read and announced, find a resting place in our lives. Amen. Our meditation today is entitled, Let the Judge Judge, and it's taken from the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 7, verses 1 through 5. Is it just me, or are there a lot of signs posted around town these days? Construction ahead signs, end of lane signs, detour signs, dead end signs, photo radar signs. Know what these signs have in common? They're warnings, and they're meant for our own good. They may annoy us, and they may slow us down, but if heeded, they'll help us arrive safely at our destination. Matthew 7 begins with some warnings that are well known inside the church and out. We've all heard these words quoted a million times, especially from the King James Version. Judge not that ye be not judged. I bet you've heard that. 
I've heard these words misused by people who don't like value judgments, who don't like it when we say that a particular behavior is right or wrong. And if we make such a statement about, say, abortion, they'll throw Jesus' words in our face and raise the rhetorical question, didn't Jesus say we shouldn't judge? What's the proper reply? Well, Jesus never put a ban on moral discernment. There are times when we have to weigh a matter to see if it squares with Scripture. A classic text on this is Hebrews 5. But solid food, or instruction, is for the mature, who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. So the Bible doesn't oppose sorting out the good from the bad, the right from the wrong. In fact, it expects us to do it. So then, what did Jesus mean by judge not? Well, let me read the passage to you from the New International Version, beginning at verse 1 of Matthew 7. Do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, when all the time there is a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Did you notice the serious warnings in the opening verses? Warning one. Do not judge, verse 1. To judge is to criticize and find fault with people. It's not the same as church discipline. That's addressed by Jesus later on in chapter 18. This is different. What Jesus had in mind is the everyday challenge of getting along with flawed people. Well, like who? Parents, children, spouses, friends, co-workers, strangers even. Judging is the nasty reaction we sometimes have towards folks who rub us the wrong way. Their behavior bugs us, and so we hold court in our hearts, accusing them, declaring them guilty, and then sentencing them. In other words, we sit in judgment on them, and we do it all the time, and we're not even aware of it. As Eugene Peterson's The Message puts it, don't pick on people. And don't jump on their failures or criticize their faults. This warning isn't about being blind to people's faults as much as it is about being generous. Well, that's the first warning. Do not judge. The second warning, it's hazardous to your health, verse 2. I can't really improve on how the version, the message puts this, so let me just quote. That critical spirit has a way of boomeranging. Isn't that picturesque? In other words, what goes around comes around. If we treat people like this, God will one day treat us like that. Sort of the reverse of the golden rule. The way we dish it out to others is the way God will dish it out to us. I realize this doesn't sound very Jesus-like. We're not used to Jesus, meek and mild, addressing us like this. So why does he? I think he does it to do us a favor. It's like the road signs we mentioned earlier. They may seem like a bother at the time, but if heeded, they will help us to arrive safely at our destination. The point is that judging isn't our job. To play the part of judge is to play the part of God. And who wants to put themselves in the place of God? Do you? (laughs) So why do we? Sometimes we make duties that aren't ours, ours. I hope that wasn't too subtle. Sometimes we make duties that aren't ours, ours. Suppose you stopped by the chapel one morning and saw me vacuuming uh, the rug while our custodian was sitting in a chair reading a magazine. What would you think? And the next day you stopped by and I was answering the phone and working on the newsletter while our secretary was sitting in a chair reading the newspaper. What would you think? Would you say, oh, that's nice. Terry's helping out. No, you would probably think, why aren't the staff doing what they're supposed to do? Don't get me wrong. In a pinch, I can vacuum, answer phones, and do word processing. But mainly, 
That's not why I'm at Balmoral. Same with judging. Judging is mainly God's job. There may be times when we need to do some judging, like in a church discipline situation, but mainly that's not what we do. So Jesus says, let the judge judge. Are you being too judgy? If you're not sure, ask your friends, your spouse, your kids. Am I being too judgy? Trust me, they'll tell you. So what should we do? We've seen that we're not to judge, but what should we do? As usual, Jesus has a remedy. To answer that question, he uses a crazy, ridiculous illustration in verses 3 to 5. It's hilarious, cartoonish. Imagine this, Jesus says. You and a friend have medical issues. Your friend has a teensy speck of grit in their eye but you've got a gargantuan hunk of lumber in yours. And for some reason, rather than calling 911, all you can think about is getting the grit out of your friend's eye. Well, that's not right. You're the one packing a two-by-four in your head. Job one, Jesus says, is you dealing with your lumber issue. You can deal with your friend's spec issue later. But first, deal with your own. So God has a part to play in the drama of life, judging, and we have a part, taking care of our own messes. Look at your own life, Jesus said. Get your own house in order, then worry about others. I suspect that once we've dealt with the spiritual two-by-fours in our own lives, the spiritual specs in others might not seem so urgent. So what are the issues in my life? Am I aware of them? Or am I so focused on other people's stuff, I don't realize my own blind spots? Do we spend too much time thinking about, oh, I don't know, the deficiencies of our prime minister or the president of the United States? Do we spend too much time thinking about the handling or mishandling of the pandemic, my spouse's failings, the kids, the pastors, or whoever? Am I so fixated on putting others right I don't attend to my own issues. Maybe I should spend less time watching cable TV to watch the latest on whatever and spend more time looking in the mirror of Scripture and concentrating on my own game. Well, today we've said that we should let the judge, God, judge and that we should mind our own business before minding others. But what about when the failings of others can't be overlooked any longer? Then what? Well, St. Paul put it ever so delicately in Galatians chapter 6. Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. But watch yourselves, or you also may be tempted. In other words, treat fellow sinners the way you'd like to be treated the next time you stumble. Well, the Bible is brimming with good news, and part of that good news is that God is taking care of business. While it's true that humans and even creatures are fallen and misshapen, God has a plan to put things right. The first time Jesus came was to launch God's program of reconciliation. That's why Jesus died, to reconcile us back to God. And when he returns, he will complete what he's already begun. He will reclaim and restore creation, and he will resurrect and renew those who are loyal to Jesus Christ. Will we be a part of this? Well, it all depends on where our loyalties lie. Where do your loyalties lie? Holy Father, we thank you for the Lord Jesus. His supremacy is unrivaled. And today we would submit to his judgment. We accept his lordship and the forgiveness achieved on the cross. Would that our lives might be conformed to his will and teaching. Amen. How hard
the mountain I could not climb In desperation I turned to heaven And spoke your name into the night Then through the darkness Your loving kindness Tore through the shadows of my soul The work is finished The end is written Jesus Christ My living hope Who could imagine So great a mercy What heart could fathom such boundless grace The God of ages Stepped down from glory To wear my sin And bear my shame The cross has spoken I am forgiven The King of kings calls me his own Savior, I'm yours forever, Jesus Christ, my living Lord. Hallelujah, praise the one who set me free, hallelujah, death has lost its grip on me, you have there's salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your buried body began to breathe. Out of the silence, the roaring lion. Declare the grave has no claim on me. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your buried body began to breathe. Out of the silence, the roaring lion declared the Yours is the victory. Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living. Christ, my living hope, God, you are my living hope. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship his holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, I worship your holy name. The sun comes up, it's a new day dawning, it's time to sing your song again. Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me Let me be singing when the evening comes Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul Worship His holy name Sing like never before, oh my soul I worship Your holy name Kind. For all your goodness 
yes, I will keep on singing. Ten thousand reasons for my heart to find. Bless the Lord of my soul, oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, I worship Your holy name. And on that day when my strength is failing, the end draws me. And my time has come Still my soul will sing your praise unending Ten thousand years and then forevermore Bless the Lord, oh my soul Oh my soul Worship His holy name Sing like never before Oh my soul I worship your holy name. Well, each week we like to leave you some resources, some questions to help you dig deeper into the meditation. And today we have three. First, Jesus forbids his followers from sitting in judgment on each other. How are we doing? Give yourself a progress report. Secondly, Jesus instructs us to focus more on our own underperformance than on the failings of others. Again, let's give ourselves a progress report. Why is this so difficult? And then thirdly, Let's pray for the grace to heed Jesus' timely teaching. I hope you'll take a few minutes to work through these questions. I think you'll find it beneficial. Our benediction today comes from Hebrews chapter 13. Now may the God of peace, who brought up from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, May he equip you with all you need for doing his will. May he produce in you, through the power of Jesus Christ, every good thing that is pleasing to him. All glory to him forever and ever. Amen. Thanks for being with us. I hope you'll be in touch with us if you have any questions or if there's anything that we can do to be of help. See you next time.